used to have this uh, um, sort of uh, pretty uninspiring office to begin with, which is what we could afford. And um, uh, Ben and I used to both get an email every time we got an order. Um, and we sort of look at each other um, if the order was from somebody that we didn't know to sort of like check whether the other person, you know, we didn't even need to say anything. We sort of both knew why we were looking at each other. And then um, I remember there was, um, there was a lady called Lisa. I won't say her last name because of GDPR purposes, but Lisa is not sort of too PII. Um, and she was the first person that um, that neither Ben nor I knew. And we we were completely bewildered that, you know, that a, a person we didn't know had ordered from our company. And we, um, we immediately sort of started Googling Lisa and finding out where she worked and finding out which of our friends she could possibly know because there's no other way that anybody could have found out about um, our company. And sure enough, she was... Um, a colleague of one of my friends um, and so it began but um, a lot of it was word of mouth that you know I don't I wish we had some magic growth hack that um, uh, that we thought of to start with anything we thought of which was like completely unscalable and wasn't a growth hack at all but kind of worked was um, we uh, used to stand um, in public places and offer people a free flower in return for their email address and then add them to um, our email database and um, and stay in touch with them. And, um, you know, we'd wear branded Bloom and Wild t-shirts. So probably there's some benefit even with people that um, didn't take the free flower. And um, we tried to be clever about where we would do this. And so one day we had the bright idea of standing in front of um, Whole Foods in um, High Street 10, because we thought that uh, the demographic of people going in and out of the store would be a good demographic to target. Anyway, after about five minutes, the um, manager of the store came out and told us that um, he was going to call the police unless we moved because, um, you know, there was some reason why um, we weren't allowed to be there or whatever. So we literally, without thinking, just sort of moved down to like, you know, a block away from like his front door and um, in front of High Street Ken um, Tube Station. And what we didn't realize is that this was basically around the corner from the office of the Daily Mail. Um, which was not like a sort of like deliberate targeting strategy, but literally the first person I offered a free flower to turned out to be a journalist that was writing for the Daily Mail. And then she asked me what I was doing. And then she wrote an article about us. And um, that was like, you know, some early fame. And so, um, you know, I wish it was uh, as well thought through as it turned out, but um, that, that started to help. Uh, God bless help. Whole Foods. Exactly. Yeah. They, uh, they didn't realize uh, how helpful they'd been making me move on. Okay, so basically a bunch of random stuff. So you're just like constantly throwing stuff at the wall, hoping that something sticks. Um, you know, would you say like there's obviously a lot of a lot that's written about, you know, your first thousand customers or your first thousand true fans. So, you know, this this strategy getting on the Daily Mail, did you get to a thousand customers through that or was there still like a considerable about amount more hustle? No, no, no. I remember um, it was... Um... I think we got like three orders instead of one order on the day that the article came out. And I was devastated because I, you know, at the time I didn't really understand the difference between like brand awareness and direct response um, marketing. And I was, uh, I thought it was terrible. If we could be in the Daily Mail, which had, you know, millions of readers and only three people were going to order, then we were doomed. But then actually, you know, for months, people told me that they'd, um, you know, I told them what I was saying. They're like, oh, I wrote about Bloom and Wild in the Daily Mail. And, and I said, well, why haven't you ordered yet? And then um, it turned out that they, they didn't have anybody to send flowers to, but they'd still heard about it, and mm. you know, we kind of were moving up in the world. And the um, actually, the um, I don't know how we got to our first thousand orders, but I know I remember that um, our first Mother's Day came round. So we started the business in the summer, and Mother's Day was the following March, um, and we got a thousand orders in the week of Mother's Day. And I remember this because um, I had to. And process them all um, individually in a spreadsheet and it took me all day to do whereas normally the order processing task took like you know, the week before it's taken an hour or something like that but obviously um, you know there's just so many more to do and I had to check that you know I'd imported all of the addresses right and things like this and um, actually a lot of those early orders came from listing on not on the high street and um, a business I've got to know well and um, it's great to see them uh, sort of exiting uh, in the last few days and um, and that was a, a really valuable channel partnership to start with. And it felt like um, 
a place where for us to sell our product to exactly the right and um, sort of consumer and demographic base. And I think from that we learned about the value of partnerships and obviously the sorts of partnerships that we've been able to do have scaled over the years with our own scale would become interesting for um, businesses that are bigger and bigger. And um, but that was the first like really significant one. Okay, now. One of the things you talked about in like the start of the conversation was about, you know, you could really work in any industry so long as uh, based on some of your upbringing, so long as you could kind of kind of had that validation, right? The the fact that people really are falling in love with what you do. So you've got into an industry where obviously that happens a lot, but usually the thanks, the love, the appreciation goes back to the recipient, not back to the company. So did you have a problem like finding out whether or not your products and services were actually being appreciated? I mean, I know it's sort of a given, but I guess it's not as much of a given in the early days because it's the problem you're looking to solve. So I don't know if I positioned the question well enough, but I see that as quite a cerebral challenge that you will have uh, enjoyed tackling. Yeah, we obsess over this. So we we very rapidly realized that it was going to be really important to get good customer reviews and build trust because this is... Um, People need to trust you in order to um, let you be the sort of conveyor of their emotions. And so we focus on getting good review scores. And, you know, if we've got a bad review, we I sort of call the person up personally and understand why. And we, we did this for the first couple of years. I did a lot of um, our customer delight myself. Um, and, you know, then we started tracking that promoter score. And then there came a time where we thought, you know, we're, we're tracking sender net promoter score, but should we be tracking recipient net promoter score as well? Because you can't systematically ask recipients to leave reviews. Obviously, anyone could go and trust pilot or Google reviews and write whatever they want. And so you sort of get them organically to a certain extent, but, um, but we thought we should be asking as well. And so um, we, um, the problem is you don't have the recipient's email address. It's not very easy to ask them. But then we started putting a, like, um, card in the box and um, requesting feedback from recipients and and um, for the last I think five or six years we've been tracking recipient NPS alongside sender NPS and that's been really valuable because we um, we both understand sort of what recipients care about which is slightly different to what senders care about they don't care about how easy it is to order online they care much more about condition on arrival um, we also understand um, where there is a delta between sender and recipient NPS and what the cause of that delta is. And often it's um, the condition on arrival of a particular type of flower. And from that, we've evolved our range. We've also um, evolved our messaging. We've, um, we do a lot of um, inbox uh, education around bud to bloom and why we deliberately send flowers that are relatively in bud and how they bloom over time and um, managing recipient expectations. And that's been really important and we've seen um, recipient NPS really grow over that because rather than people assuming that we sent them um, flowers that aren't in good condition, they realize that we sent them flowers that are so fresh that they aren't fully bloomed yet and um, over time that's become appreciated. And I think now as letterbox flowers have become more of a um, mainstream phenomenon, that's also, um, there's been a shift in consumer expectation and people now um, expect and appreciate flowers coming in this format and that's helped recipient NPS grow further. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting, I guess, you know, the same time as your company's been growing, um, there has been an increased interest as well, fortunately, in sustainability too. So has that had a positive impact, have you found, on like customer expectation matching, you know, the kind of values that you want to have as a company as well? 100%. So, um, and I think there's been a, um, you know, in parallel, there's been an increased interest in an embracing of sustainability um, by our business. And you know, we issued um, our first Bloom and Wild Sustainability Report last summer. We're now fully carbon neutral as a business. We send zero waste to landfill. And so we've um, worked really hard to uh, be a business that does things sustainably that, you know, and many more things. Those are some, you know, some of our highlights. I think... Um, some of the underlying business model decisions that we took in the early days have positioned us well for this. So fundamentally, our boxes are smaller than um, boxes of uh, um, other flower companies because they need to fit through less boxes. We're using less cardboard. We're using less space in um, delivery vans than people sending flowers in bigger boxes. Because we have a subscription proposition, we have the ability to um, 
choose what people get rather than them choosing what they get for some of our deliveries. It's, a, it's not a very high percentage, but it's enough to um, give us a buffer to balance supply and demand um, and forecasting at the individual um, product level while making sure that subscribers get variety. And that's meant that our waste is virtually zero. Um, sourcing flowers direct from growers has also meant that waste is um, uh, much lower than if you pass through middlemen who have misforecast and damaged flowers in handling. So a number of the decisions that we've taken um, over the years have been um, have resulted in us building a more sustainable flower company. And as we've more um, proactively embraced this over the last couple of years, um, it's meant that it's been um, we've been in a strong position to um, really be on the front foot and um, you know, communicate these goals and, and make further commitments to you know, reduce carbon footprint in addition to, to just um, you know, offsetting carbon and things like that. So I remember talking to you a few years ago about what your biggest challenges were, and yeah. I'm wondering if they still are the same. So obviously, you know, it might sound very hard and tricky um, sourcing fresh flowers, sending them across Europe now, um, doing it in the right kind of order management system and right time so people get good quality products, etc. But I always remember you going on and on and on about your website. Um, I, like, I don't know if this is uh, still a pain point for you or you remember these, these pains, but I guess this is my loaded question to say, was that the biggest challenge that you've had in your journey? And if so, be fascinating for listeners to understand why. Um, I think it was probably the biggest mistake that uh, that we made. So when Ben and I started the business, he asked if we built a model. We did build a model and there was um, a line item um, uh, which said build website um, and the budget for that was £3,000, um, which was mm. uh, um, what we thought it was going to cost. Um, Sounds spot on, mate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, that was in, like, the first month, which was how long it was going to take. And then the, the budget was zero in all of the other columns after that because um, we were going to uh, finish it. So, uh, so we obviously had no idea. And um, but basically, we said we we're paying for this with our own savings. And, you know, the, um, we didn't have that much saved up and we couldn't afford to spend more. So um, we set out trying to find somebody who built us a website for three thousand pounds. And, you know, you can. Um, you can find somebody who'll do anything for you at any price, but um, in a way, you get what you pay for. And um, we, um, you know, we got a website for three thousand um, pounds, and um, to a certain extent, it worked. It, you know, people were able to place orders. I remember we got seven orders in our first week, and so, um, so that for, that um, that worked well. Um, but it didn't work in all sorts of ways. Um, it didn't work on a mobile. Um, it uh, didn't. Um, it said accepted Visa and MasterCard, but it actually didn't accept MasterCard, but we didn't realize this, you know, all sorts of things like that. And um, and basically, we went through various um, sets of developers inheriting the code for, from this website, and um, but we remained very cost conscious. And because of that, um, it wasn't particularly good. And I think, you know, once we raised um, uh, our second more meaningful sum of seed funding, we felt that... Um, we um, we basically needed to get our tech under control, and we met um, somebody who started out being our tech advisor, and he's now on our board. He's been on our board for many years. His name's Jackson Hull, so shout out to him. He's now the CTO at Oak North, and he was CTO at One Fine Stay at the time. And he's he's moved through a number of companies since then, and um, he's been a brilliant advisor and board member to our business. And um, he basically gave me some tough love and told me I needed to start again, um, and he'd helped me. Um, I found some developers, he'd, um, he'd uh, interview them for me and make sure that um, we get people who knew what we were doing. So we did that and we started again. And we, um, yeah, we hired uh, our first two um, full-time in-house developers about a year after we started. And um, we worked on, on our own website uh, and we, we launched it. I remember I stayed up all night with them. Um, with the two of them helping them, uh, you know, QA it while they were sort of working on it um, in the office. And then we were all sort of asleep on the office uh, sofas in the morning when everybody else came in. And one of the guys still with us brought in donuts. Um, and, you know, it's actually, it was, uh, it was super hard work. But it was like a memorable high getting this thing launched. And actually the many things have changed since then, but the platform that 
these two guys built and released um, back in uh, you know October 2014 when it launched. It's still the platform that we're we're building on today. And like full credit to them for um, building something that was you know extensible and robust and all of the things that we didn't think about to start with. But um, you know it was a complete false economy and it probably cost us like. You know, over a year in progress and also credibility from customers, from investors, and that we knew what we were doing. And, and so I think in hindsight, we were too cheap. Um, obviously, like not only did we not spend enough, but actually it was um, it was fairly destructive rather than just um, a, you know, a time delay to have done so. I want to go back into like, you know, you mentioned just earlier as well, uh, flowers and gifts and adding a whole... Uh, extra word on has you know shifted the focus of the business for the first time in a long time how do you actually approach testing new products I mean given that your products you know there's high quality there's a lot of effort um, involved and then there's your desire to delight everyone all the time I'm guessing you can't be that scrappy like a normal startup is with those kind of constraints. So how how does the bloom and wild like process school of thought go through this idea? Yeah, so we can be relatively scrappy. I mean, there's a bit of a lead time because you need to, um, it depends, within flowers, like the lead time can be relatively quick to sort of try out different types of flowers. And there's a constant um, process of testing, like we call it vase life testing um, and um, transit testing of different um, flower types to make sure that we can um, the work and you know what works in combination with what else. So um, we're doing that all the time. Actually, with other product types and um, we've been able to to be relatively rapid with our experimentation the area where we've done the most has been letterbox plants so and um, the first letterbox plant was a letterbox orchid which came with a um, soft canvas pot and a separate um, uh, root ball root ball connected and additional soil to put into the pot and um, you know we still sell that product it's not a it's not a hero product but it was um, our first step into um, plants and um, I guess the the really successful product in the plant space has been mini letterbox Christmas trees, which um, you know people get super excited about every every winter, and they're um, they're a really important uh, sort of uh, aspect of what we do, and our customers love them, and you know that we build magic around them every year. And um, my mum still has hers up. Also, my favourite thing about your uh, letterbox Christmas tree is you can plant them, right? Yeah. Exactly. They turn yeah. into real trees. She's very excited. It's growing quite slowly. I've got to say, I'm not sure it's going to be a real size tree by <laughs> by next year, yeah. but she's definitely excited. No, no, they grow. I've got some friends who send me a picture of it every year. I've got two or three friends who do this, and um, and they've uh, some of them are, you know, they watch them grow alongside their children, and um, you know, they give them a run for their money. So um, don't be, give them a chance. Um, yeah, yeah. But they, you can replant them. Um, and actually, I think some of the innovation has also been around stuff like that. So, you know, um, starting to give people instructions how to replant their Christmas trees. Um, this year, we sold Christmas trees um, without decorations for people who might have kept their decorations from last year. Um, and we, we only sold them to people who bought our Christmas trees in the past. So um, we're trying to think about the sort of like sustainability impact we've the other thing that we've done in this area that I, I'm, I think is really cool is we started selling tulips with their bulbs on, um, and then you can replant the bulbs as well. People can grow tulips in the future. So um, I think sometimes the innovation isn't, hey, should we start selling this new thing? Um, often the new thing isn't actually that inspiring. I remember once we um, we wanted to have like a gift box, so we did a box with like, I think it had a pair of socks, a pack of coffee and a notebook in it, and it just didn't feel particularly and sort of interesting or differentiated um, so uh, I'm less into that type of innovation but I think often innovation around your core your core product and making it feel more differentiated and more appealing to your customers is really important mm, yeah I mean I, I completely agree but you know we're talking about you know that's a lot of innovation in the flower space and without sounding super obvious you know you're not inventing new flowers you're picking the right products for your customers and then you're thinking really intelligently about how to package them so that they can serve the right purpose encourage people to do the sustainability side etc so i think the innovation comes in like the life cycle um and the customer delight i'm super curious now how you pick gifts 
what is and isn't good enough and how do you go about testing this stuff or yeah where are you in that thinking and what is the process again for someone yeah. who understandably you know is extremely brand conscious and anything can be a gift so curation yeah. is really where this is at so take us through that process of course so look we're at the very early stages of this but um over 90 percent of our um orders are um are gifts um, and flowers it's marginally lower in plants but we're still you know primarily a gifting company even in the plant space um and so i guess we need to strike a balance between um selling other things that people will want to buy as gifts people's mission for shopping with us is you know heavily a gifting mission and um, but also selling things that people um think are like related to our brand um 1-800-Flowers, um, which is currently the world's largest flower company, have gone too far on this. And if you look at the sort of top navigation on their homepage, one of the things you can buy is barbecued meats. We're not good at yours, need meat or plants, um, which is actually uh, more uh, pertinent than maybe you realise. But um, we're not going to start selling meats um, to our customers because it's um, just completely incongruous with what they expect from a flower um, company. So we need to find our position on that spectrum. We're able to test stuff with add-ons. Um, we found that people like edible things and people like things that smell nice or smell floral. And so um, while we haven't decided what we're, um, you know, what's like next on the product roadmap, um, so to speak, we will continue to experiment with um, naturally adjacent products like this. Got it. And from a innovation point of view do you see yourself creating your own things is that is that kind of where you're going or is it curating uh like other expert products in general it could be either or both and i guess it depends on the category and um you know the more the more this is a bit of a sort of we, we haven't figured it out yet so this is a bit of a sort of like planning answer rather than like sure answer, but um feels like the more core it is to our skill set, the more likely we are to try and create it ourselves. So we've recently, this is a bit obvious, gone into dried flowers, um, for example, where we feel like we're well placed to um, to come up with great dried flower propositions because the skill set is relatively similar. I can't imagine, this isn't like Bloom and Wild is planning to launch chocolates, but um, if we did, um, and it's not a like incongruous thing to consider, we wouldn't, um, I'd imagine like, you know, build a chocolate factory and start like... Uh, well, if you do, there's a spot going in Israel, I'm sure. Well, quite exactly. Yeah, uh, maybe it's uh, it's not in the family anymore. So, um, yeah. But chocolate's yeah. in your blood is the kind of, uh, yeah, the kind of cool statement you want to hear from a CEO. <laughs> well, quite. So, um, you know, I guess it, it depends how, um, how close it is to our current capabilities and like what consumers would perceive as, um, you know, us having the authority to do. Makes sense. Okay, so um, you've recently raised £75 million in a phenomenal fundraising um, uh, round, which, you know, massive congrats to you because, I, like I said, I've known you since you started the business and every round has been so purposeful, so well thought through, well, like, well, well timed, as in it's good space but between every round I've always found as well. Um, and then this one just a whopping round, you know, over a hundred million dollars uh, for international expansion. So what does international expansion mean? Where have you got your sights set and where have you got international expansion wrong so far? And what have you learned from that as well? And he's, oh. he's smiling because he knows this is a loaded question because we've spoken about it before. <laughs> it's, also, it's, a, it's a series of connected questions. So um, our focus with this round is to build um, the leading um, flower um, and related gifting platform um, across Europe. And um, we don't rule out expanding beyond Europe in the future, but um, the purpose of this, um, this money is to... Um, really look at the European la flower landscape and um, build a proposition of a similar um, scale and um, like quality of proposition in other countries in Europe as we've done um, in the UK. And, um, you know, that we've raised We'd raised up before this point um, about 25 million um, pounds um, in order to um, get to market leadership in the UK and obviously this isn't how we do the math but um, 
roughly speaking, the UK market, we also haven't spent all of that, the UK market is a little under a quarter of the European cloud market. So there's more complexity to how we thought about the amount than that, but I think um, it's the order of magnitude we'll need to um, rapidly um, build something comparable across Europe. And we started this already, so it's not that we're, um, we raised the money and then sort of like um, looked at the map. So we're, we've been in Germany and France for um, three and a half years now. And actually, we've had quite different fortunes in the two. In Germany, our business is on a really strong trajectory. Obviously, it's smaller than in the UK because it started later. But um, the growth trajectory actually is um, even better than it was in the UK um, in terms of our market share. And we're really... Uh, confident in our ability to continue to, to scale the business um, in Germany. Um, in France, we found it much more challenging. I think operationally, we've, um, we've made decisions that have turned out not to be the right ones. Um, in particular, we um, uh, we based our logistics, um, you know, far from Paris, which is like the sort of central logistical point for most French logistical networks. And this has resulted sometimes in us having um, worse delivery success rate and therefore um, flowers can be not only delayed but also therefore in less good condition when they arrive and therefore we see worse net promoter score etc and um, I think probably the bigger thing is that um, it's been difficult to really describe what the Bloom and Wild brand is a you know quite clearly British brand stands for in France whereas in Germany I think that's been a positive and um, the, there's a perception of our brand as um, associated with sort of you know, English uh, like country gardens, which uh, have, there's like a sort of positive romantic uh, perception of in Germany, you know, even like connections to like the royal family and um, royal wedding tea parties and um, this sort of stuff has really been like on trend in Germany in a way that it, that it hasn't in France. And I, I wish I could say it was deliberate, but it's something that we've sort of like learned over time. I think more latterly as well, um, in Germany, some of them um, are and embracement of uh, embracing of um, sustainability and um, eco credentials has been particularly important. Obviously, that's important everywhere, but Germany um, has really you know, led Europe in terms of um, you know embracing use of recycling and other you know eco impact concerns um, uh, much before it became um, you know uh, something that people cared about as much in, in the UK and other countries. And so um, having this. Um, lower impact product um, maybe slightly less expensive product for a similar bouquet of flowers but then um, like a craft a DIY element which is also a really popular trend in Germany has really resonated well. But some of these um, the cultural resonance of the proposition um, does differ between countries and I think that's really important. Mm, yeah it makes lots of sense um, and I guess for you as a CEO, super interesting to learn that, right? As in almost crazy to think about um, the cultural impact that even Netflix shows can have on whole countries and how that might actually change the perception of your entire brand and whether or not it should enter a market. This is an assumption from my side. Yeah, look, um, I, think, um, I think when we started... Um, Excuse me. When we started, we um, we thought that maybe what we had developed in the UK would be more um, applicable across countries, um, and actually, it's turned out to be more nuanced. And um, and while um, many aspects of it are applicable, not everything is applicable. So um, the supply chain and the technology platform um, and uh, you know digital experience are heavily applicable. The way that we um, work with delivery partners is um, reasonably applicable, but there are nuances in France. Um, you know, delivery people use like parcel shops much more. Like buildings have door codes. You know, people tend to live in flats much more, especially in um, sort of urban areas. Um, you know, so so there are considerations like that. But then from a sort of like brand and um, consumer proposition and how people um, interact with our category, even what sorts of products they buy within it, how much they spend. Um, to what occasions things are really different and understanding that and um, trying to find a way of maintaining the similarities and um, accepting the complexity of the differences between countries without um, it becoming unmanageable uh, has been something that we've really been grappling with over the last couple of years. And I think we've started to um, get a handle on and hence the, you know, the confidence that we can develop it over other countries. 
What would you say has been your toughest challenge as a CEO in your whole journey at Bloom and Wild? Yeah, I thought about this. Um, so there are a few ways of thinking about this. At the very beginning, there were lots of moments that um, where I just thought that perhaps the whole thing might not work. Um, I remember, for example, uh, learning that Royal Mail um, only accepted boxes that were 60 centimetres long and we ordered boxes. And then I took them literally to the post office and the um, the chap behind the counter at the post office got out a tape measure and told me that the box was 61 centimetres long and therefore you couldn't accept it. Um, you know, my, uh, literally my heart sunk, you know, into the like, centre of the earth at that point. And, you know, since like redesign our boxes so that they're unambiguously the right size and, and things like that. But um, there have been lots of moments like that where we didn't have ventilation in our boxes and therefore like the flowers got mouldy and um, we made a ton of mistakes early on. And I think, you know, as we've um, grown to like scale up phase, um, a lot of the, the biggest challenges has been around like navigating protecting nurturing and maintaining our culture and especially in the you know having worked from home for you know almost a year now um, and onboarded about a third of our team during that process this has been um like super important to get right our culture is um is so precious and valuable to us but so much of it has um developed through people's relationships with each other and you know enjoying spending time together and you know everyone has like uh, screen fatigue and so um, it's just much harder to navigate that and I think we've done a good job of it and we've um, we've tried to adapt how we do it but um, I feel like ultimately I need to be the custodian of that culture and I need to continue to do so um, as we scale. And what about you as a CEO personally what are you really good at and what are you really bad at and what would you say to the third part of that um, have you been developing best at so going from quite bad to on the path to becoming better? Yeah, so I think what I'm good at is kindness. I, it's super important for me to be kind to everybody that I interact with. I think it connects to like my desire to please people. I think it's really and um, sort of uh, like uh, you know innate in the in the business that we're in that you have to do it kindly um, and. I think I've tried to be kind to our consumers and, and those that we work with and to our team. And, um, you know, obviously there are, I don't get like 100% positive feedback on that, but I think people recognize that I try and that it matters to me. And, and I think that's something that I'll, um, you know, maybe it means I don't like strike the hardest commercial bargain and I like leave something on the table and in a negotiation or whatever, but I'm actually okay with that. And um, I think the scope to, like share and success rather than like orders. And so like, that's fine. And um, I think, you know, the other thing I'd say, which kind of connects all of your questions, I, I'm both good at this and bad at this and like learning on it is that I'm very detail oriented and I'm, uh, I do think bottom up, I notice specifics rather than like patterns or themes. And then I like make lists of specific things. And then I, I find how they connect together. And it's, it's just how my mind works. And I've tried to be less like that and um you know make my less uh, like a uh, less granular level of detail and um, i think people can feel that uh this means that i'm uh, like micro involved in their work sometimes i am micro involved in their work and um, because i do notice things and because i have an obsession with getting stuff right for our customers and in a way i think that's a good thing in a way i've also learned that um sometimes i should be like less quick to give feedback and maybe somebody else will notice it first and, and I don't need to always be the first person to say something or I can um, like think about uh, whether there's a process that we could that could have like worked differently rather than like you know commenting on the specific thing and stuff like that so um, that's been my learning journey it's also been around like hiring people and I think as I've um, you know been fortunate to like raise money and therefore build a stronger team around me. I've had a greater degree of trust in those around me and therefore I felt less of a need for involvement in, in some of these areas. And that's, um, that's something that I'm going to continue to do um, going forward. I'm also like trying to juggle more things and more stress. And um, yeah, my wife uh, encourages me to think about which of the balls I'm juggling are made of rubber and which ones are made of glass and um, to just focus on the glass ones. It's, it's the, she didn't come up with that analogy, but it's something that I, I think of regularly when I 
you know, have like two minutes between meetings and there are like 40 unread Slack channels and I like figure out which ones to read and which ones to like just, uh, you know, leave to their Let own. Bounce. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What would you say is the most difficult bit of feedback that you've received? So you've shared, you've shared like, you know, what you're working on, what's good, what's bad, but what's been really uncomfortable for you to hear and what did you learn from it? I think what I find most difficult to hear, and I hear this from customers probably you know, every few months or so, um, like I get an email or, you know, I still do like customer phone calls and like uh, customer delight inbox replies. And I get something along the lines of, um, you know, the way that you are trying to sell your product doesn't work um, and your company should not exist. Um, and, you know, and, and there's often in these situations, there's no amount of persuading you can do. And like, if you sort of um, like try and argue, then, um, you know, like I don't become like un, 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 unempathetic or sort of come across like I'm not listening to the customer. But um, on the other hand, like I think our company should exist, and I, I've spent eight years of my life building it to be like the best company I possibly can. And I would never. Um, I think the related feedback is, you know, you set out to try and ruin my like mum's birthday or whatever it is, and like uh, you know, I would. Um, there isn't a like. A bone in my body that would try to ruin anything for anybody like this it's it's sort of so far from my dna and to sort of hear that not only has that happened which i'm like mortified about but that people think i'm trying to do it deliberately or that i've like constructed a company that like shouldn't exist which because like flowers can't possibly be sent this way and um, it's just like um it's something that i find difficult to process on a lot of levels but it's just so different to like both my own personal DNA and to what I'm trying to achieve as a business and get my team to achieve. And so I find that hard to, to hear, but um, luckily we don't hear it um, as much. And um, you know, often we're able to turn it around and then, um, you know, sometimes people want to be heard and um, sometimes you have to pick up the phone and it's, it's time consuming and you're busy as a CEO, but they want to hear from you, not from, from somebody else. Um, uh, but I remember some of those conversations and often um, those people turn out to be, um, like long-term advocates and you know and and i always learn from those calls i've got a very funny anecdote for you which i was just, it's literally just come up and it's so relevant but it sounds like it's um crapping on one of your competitors which is absolutely not what i'm doing but this is the verbatim conversation that happened which is um we had a customer basically get frustrated that we took a, a payment from them. They were on an annual subscription and it renewed and they hadn't read the emails, basically, like warning them, letting them know. But regardless, um, they hadn't seen it. It came out of their account and then they were like furious on customer service, going, going mad at us. So I called him and I was like, obviously, you know, as you know, as a CEO, when you care about something, um, and you care about your customers, you definitely don't want them furious. So it goes beyond customer service and you're like, I'll pick this one up. So I called him and uh, basically it took him about two minutes before and like on a tirade and started describing things to me. And I'm like, this does not sound quite right. Basically, he thought I was the CEO of Freddy's Flowers because he'd also complained to them that day. He was going ballistic at me about his flower delivery. Um, so we had one of those really funny conversations where for like two minutes, you'll kind of both think that you're talking about the same thing, but you're actually not. And I had to like let him know that I was actually from Heights and it was a different complaint that he'd had. <laughs> so it was actually quite funny. It was actually a really good way to diffuse the conversation because he was like very happy to have the sort of silliness of the, of the situation. So that was fortunate um but yeah it does happen as you know like you have these conversations with customers and you know sometimes there's no making them happy sometimes it is literally the call that will make them happy and then if yeah. you're lucky there'll be these silly moments that you can both laugh at there are we actually occasionally get these where um where people complain about a bk um and it isn't our bk and we're 100 percent sure that it's not our bouquet or like our greeting card or like our printer system or whatever and and customers will just insist that we've sold them this bouquet and they want a refund from us and that you know they don't accept that it's not our product there's no record of them in the system and yeah that, that can be a little bit of a sort of like impasse to navigate and often we try and like find it on a competitor's website to prove to them that it's it's somebody else not ours so and um, we've been there too 
Good. Okay. Just checking. Right. So starting to wrap out, uh, wrap up now. I'd love to know. I mean, the big question, really, Aaron, and um, it's a really obvious one, but I want your answer. You know, you've walked into these meetings, you've raised seventy-five million pounds, so a hundred million plus dollars. There's obviously a story there about just how big a flower company can be. So, what is that story? How big can you be, and where do you say, "Yep, fulfilled that mission"? It will never fulfill our mission because we'll never have a hundred percent market share. Um, Correct we'll answer. Have, uh, so, uh, we'll always strive to. Um, the the flower category globally is worth around fifty um, billion um, pounds, um, and yeah, that represents over a billion flower transactions every year. And you know we're doing a few million of those, so we've uh, we've made meaningful headway. But there's a there's a huge way to go around the world. And um, the the flower category is just one of a few categories that we can play in. We can play in plants. We can play in home accessories. We can play in gifting more broadly. The um, global market for gifting, of which flowers is a couple of percent, is like several hundreds of billions of dollars. So um, now we. Are, not all of this is immediately accessible right now, but if you think about, can we sell other products? Can we sell them in other countries? Can we sell them in other ways? We've recently, for example, um, started selling flowers in Sainsbury's, which um, uh, which we're really proud of. And I think we've um, brought um, our levels of innovation and product differentiation into a physical store environment. And um, all of that really, um, you know, really adds up to being able to build a, a business that's um, exciting for investors and they can see, um, you know, being worth, I guess, economical sums in the future. Fair enough. D- does the problem of sending and receiving flowers still excite you like it did originally? Even more so, because I feel like we can actually crack it now. To start with, you know, it's like a, a guy with a £3,000 website handing out flowers one at a time outside the tube station. And, you know, I didn't really have any right to succeed. I feel now I've been able to, um, like, amass a team of people and build, like, capabilities and differentiation that people at scale really care about and and, and really value. And you know, yet the, the vast majority of people in the world have never experienced Bloom and Wild. And we also have a, so many ways that we can still make it better. So I feel like... Um, you know, rather than it being a problem that we might be able to succeed at, I think it's a problem that we can succeed at and we just need to carry on doing so and, and continue getting better. So um, I think different founders enjoy, enjoy different stages to different amounts. And um, personally, I love this stage you know, a lot more than uh, trying to do everything myself badly in the, in the first year and on the cheap. Very fair. Very- what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given on your journey and by who? Um, I was introduced by um, by one of, well, by my best friend and to, um, to my co-founder, Ben. And um, he really pushed me to, to get going um, with starting a company. And, uh, you know, I had all sorts of hesitations about maybe this wasn't the right company and maybe I could do something different. And, um, Maybe it wasn't going to work, and yeah, you know, I had a good job and whatever. And um, he basically uh, persuaded me that nobody um, regrets trying, and that you know the sort of safety net of my job that I had before would still be there. And um, I needed that push because um, I was sort of going from uh, something that I was doing well at, and you know, and I was comfortable at, to something that um, you know I didn't have any skills at, and actually I had even fewer skills than I thought I did because I thought that I had these transferable skills from being a management consultant actually you know, other than like you know, knowing how to make like some slides to pitch an investor or like build a model you don't really like have any like applicable skills for starting a company from that sort of path and um, they've become more uh, relevant now as we've um, as we've started to scale but um, I think I um I needed that encouragement to to do something that, um, in hindsight, I'm so glad I've like spent this period of my life doing, and I'm going to spend the next period of my life continuing to do. 